So thank you, Antonio. And uh, thanks so much for inviting Manuel and me to this beautiful location. Uh, we've always wanted to come to Sicily. And thank you for bringing us to this wonderful conference as well. So um, I'm gonna, my, I'm gonna talk about the theoretical computer science perspective on consciousness and it, artificial general intelligence. So this is, I guess, something totally different than um, many of what the talks you're hearing here. And it's uh, joint work with myself and Manuel Blum. I'm gonna give it like an introduction and then Manuel will fill in other details afterwards. And we also have a third author who's worked with us, um, Avram Blum. Okay, so um, what is theoretical computer science? It's a branch of mathematics concerned with the understanding of the underlying principles of computation and complexity, including the implications of resource limitations, particularly time and space. Okay, so let me just give you a little quick history if you don't know about theoretical computer science. It's, essentially started in the 30s with Kurt Gödel and Turing, and they were interested in the notion of computability, what's computable, what's not. And that started a whole generation of logicians looking into uh, problems that were computable and those were not, and even going into hierarchies of uncomputability, how high could you go, how uncomputable could you go. So that went on for about 30 years, until the 1960s when people started to use uh, these large computers and uh, the logicians and mathematicians started to realize that amongst the solvable, the computable problems, even those finite ones, some of them seem to defy easy, um, easy solutions. So even though in principle you could easily put an algorithm to solve it, it would take too long. So uh, a new th part of the theory came into being, and that was amongst the solvable, amongst the computable, what's feasibly computable and what's not. And you may have heard of this very famous problem, does P equal NP, and that came out of that era. Um, another interesting thing happened in the 80s, which was really kind of interesting for mathematics. You know, in engineering, uh, typically if you harness the the hardness of a problem to get power. And this is the first time we were able to har harness the power of what's not feasible. So in other words, all of the cryptographically secure sort of randomness, uh, cryptographically secure communications, what we were able to do was embed hard problems in the encryption. And the only way you could actually uh, decrypt was to solve these hard problems. So it was kind of a dual challenge. And I think that was a very exciting period. Then in the 90s, uh, quantum computing came into being, the theory of quantum computing. And now in the 20s, maybe we're gonna look at consciousness and artificial general intelligence. So um, we're gonna talk about that here. So I'm gonna talk about the conscious Turing machine. And um, it's inspired in part by Alan Turing's simple yet powerful model of a computation. In other words, here we have a 23-state universal Turing machine, and it can compute whatever you can compute in the cloud or in a supercomputer. So, you know, these large language models are using the cloud, lots and lots of computers, but whatever they could do, we could do on this simple uh, Turing machine, 23-state Turing machine. And as we all know, it's very hard to get our head around the cloud and see what's happening and truly to understand it. On the other hand, you can get your head around the Turing machine and you can prove at least what you can do, what you can compute, what you can't. So that's a big motivation for us is to get something very, very simple in our model. And the other stream of uh, motivation or inspiration for us is uh, Bernard Barr's Global Workspace Theory of Consciousness, the theater model. And this, uh, Barr's theory of global workspace and also the global neuronal workspace theory of Dehaene and Shenzhou um, really seem to lend itself to a more mathematical approach to consciousness coming from our pers particular perspective. And so Barr's describes conscious awareness through a theater analogy, and what uh, Barr says is that consciousness is the activity of actors in a play performing on a stage of working or short-term memory, and the inner speech actor is often on stage, so um, maybe I'm the inner speech actor here. And their performance, the inner speech actor's performance is under observation by a huge audience of unconscious processors in long-term memory that are sitting in the dark, 
well, you're not sitting in the dark, but just think of yourselves as all my long-term memory processors out there. And what happens is these processors vie amongst themselves to get their script or their query or information on stage to be broadcast to the audience. Okay, so the best example that we like to give is this, uh, the things that most people have experienced. You're at a party, you see somebody you, you know, but for the life of you, you can't remember their name, okay? And um, what happens is then you go home, does this happen to anybody here? Yes, no? Uh, my, even my young students say this has happened to them. And then you go home and about an hour later, her name pops up into your head. And so, so what's, and you can't do anything about it by that time, right? So what's going on? So what's happening is there's one of these long-term memory processors that's really embarrassed when you see your friend and you can't remember her name, and you call, you call where you first met. So you, um, and that question goes up to the short-term memory, like you met in Tucson the last time around, and that gets broadcast to all your long-term memory processors. Okay, and then one of the processes remembers something what the, she does, and of course she's a computer scientist, but she's interested in consciousness. And that gets into short-term memory, that processor gets its information up to short-term memory, gets broadcast down, and another processor says, well, her name begins with T, that comes up to short-term memory, gets broadcast down, and a little while later, her name comes up and it's Sarah, actually. We'll, we'll talk about that later, why that happens. So the conscious self on stage doesn't know how or, or where her name was found. Doesn't just pops up, don't know how. Okay, so I'm now going to go into the structure, uh, uh, give you an idea of the structure of our conscious Turing machine. But before I do that, I'd like to tell you what it is not. So the CTM, the conscious Turing machine, is not a model of the brain. Okay, it's far too simple for that. It's a simple formal model or mathematical model of consciousness. And it considers the brain at a very high level of abstraction. It levels well above neurons and neuronal activity. So in some sense, we're above the fray. Where is this happening? Okay. Um, it's not even a standard Turing machine because what gives our conscious Turing machine its feeling of consciousness is not the input-output map nor its computing power, but what's under the hood. And what's under the hood is a global workspace architecture. It's something that we're calling predictive dynamics, and these are cycles of prediction, feedback, and learning. Okay. And some key special processors, for example, the inner speech processor, inner vision, inner sensation processor, and in particular, the model of the world processor. And these processors communicate in a rich multimodal language, which, I call, which we call brainish. We'll go into that soon. And of course, because we're coming from theoretical computer science, we pay attention to resource limitations, both with respect to the construction of our machine and the explanations that it gives. And particularly, we're mindful that computation co takes time, and that comes into some of our explanations of what's going on. So formally, we define the conscious Turing machine as a seven-tuple. This short-term memory, long-term memory, up-tree, down-tree, links, input, output. And I'm going to give you a cartoon sketch of, or a sketch of the model. So we start with a tiny short-term memory. It's a read-write memory, and that's our stage. And on stage, we can have one chunk of information. Now, I know that George Miller said the magic number, seven plus or minus two, uh, is the amount of information or, that we can hold at any one time in short-term memory. But we can uh, get away with one chunk, and since we're looking for simplicity, we're really going to go for one chunk on our stage. Then we have a large collection of long-term memory processors. Now, we imagine 10 to the 7th, there are 10 to the 7th cortical columns, 10 to the 8th, very large collection, and these processors are start out very independently. They're very powerful. Some have special purpose, some don't have any purpose yet, and they will get purpose during its lifetime. Okay, that's our audience. We have input coming into our conscious Turing machine from the outside world, 
from the outside world through sensors like eyes, ears, nose, uh, uh, feeling, sensation. And we have output coming from special processors to actuators to affect the outside world. So we do have this CT embedded in a larger out, out environment with input and output and that can affect the environment. Okay, then every clock, clock tick, every moment in time, each of the long-term memory processors puts a chunk of information into a very well-defined competition to get up on stage. And I'll, I'll tell you what the competition looks like shortly. And it gets, goes through the competition, it's an uptree thing, and as soon as it gets into uh, the, the winning chunk, gets into um, the short-term memory to the stage, it's immediately broadcast down to all long-term memory processors. So the moment the information gets up here, it gets broadcast down to all the long-term memory processors. And so right now, I can make some formal definitions. I could say the conscious content of our CTM at time t is the chunk that's in short-term memory um, at time t, or it's winner of the up to competition. Okay, that's just a formal definition. And then I'll say conscious awareness in the CTM is at the next time moment, t plus one, is the reception of the broadcast of the conscious content by all the long-term memory processors. So that's what we're calling conscious awareness. Again, just a definition in this machine. As soon as all the processors receive the what was on the stage, we're saying that CTM is consciously aware of that information. Okay, so I've told you a little bit about what the short-term memory is, long-term memory, the uptree competition. I'll go into that a little bit more detail, the downtree broadcast, but now I'd like to talk about links. So as this um, conscious turning at the beginning, as I said, they're all these processes are independent. They're not connected in any way. But as soon as a processor sees that another processor has information that is relevant to it or that it likes, it will form a bi-directional link. So for example, uh, the processor that asked, what's her name? And then later on, the processor said her name was Sarah, I believe, and that was correct. They will form a, a link between those two processors, a bi-directional link, okay? So that's how links start to form. Um, and in fact, uh, the co communication between these processors now are in a language which we call Brainish. Now this is a rich multimodal language. So each word in Brainish is not just like an English or Italian or French word or, or Chinese word. It contains, it's a fusion of many things. It's an image, it contains, it may contain a sound, a sensation, a smell. So if you have the word rose, maybe that's together with the, the color red. Uh, the, the nice smell, the sweet smell of the rose, the, the nice uh, ta uh, touch of the rose, all of that would be combined in a multimodal word, uh, which in, in Brainish. And uh, we have a student at Carnegie Mellon who uh, uh, does multimodal machine learning, and he's showing how uh, our machine can learn its language, Brainish. And uh, obviously, different machines will have their different, we each have our own Brainish language. So what links tend to do is they can help change conscious communication that goes through short-term memory into unconscious communication. So that's one of the powers of links. And so, for example, when you first learn to ride a bicycle, everything's going through consciousness. You're having to uh, be consciously aware of all the movements that you're making, but after a while, links are forming between your vision and your motor processor and all of these processors, and uh, the, you can ride a bike most of the time uh, unconsciously. You're not thinking about what you're doing. The other thing that's interesting about links, um, I thought was kind of curious. Um, I, Alison Gutnick is a psychologist who looks at uh, cognition and uh, consciousness in infants, babies, and she's always saying that babies are more conscious than adults. And that seems so weird. I mean, you don't think of babies as being uh, more conscious than adults. But in fact, in our model, our baby CTM is much more conscious than adults because all of the communication, everything at the beginning is going through short-term memory. It's going up, coming down. So it may not be connected in lots of ways until connections form. So at the very beginning, our baby CTM is very conscious, at least by our definition. And this is how I talked to Allison. And somehow that's how she understands it as well. 
Um, okay, so let me go to the uptree competition, and this is a, it's a little bit of mathematics. It's very simple mathematics, and the reason it's simple is that we want things to be very fast. So I'm going to tell you how this competition works, or I'm going to give you a sketch of the competition. So we have a binary uptree here, and as I said, that at each moment in time, each long-term memory processor puts a chunk into the competition. So again, because we're trying to be very formal, we formally defined a chunk. Now, in the literature, people say chunk is a word, a phrase, a link, uh, something. It could be a poem, you know, the first part of a poem that links to the second part of the poem and whatever. But we want to formally define chunk. So we define chunk as a six tuple. So the CTM was a seven tuple. This is a six tuple. And the first four parts of the six tuple are very important. So when a processor P puts a chunk into the competition, it starts off, the chunk starts off with the address of the processor. So if we have 10 to the seventh processors, the address there could be seven digit numbers. So it's, it's pretty small. So we want the chunk not to be too large because we have to do computations with it and we don't want it to be too big. Okay, so it starts with the address, pretty good. And that's very important because if it wins the competition and it comes down somewhere, comes down to all the audience, the audience will get that information, the address, so it'll know where the information came from. It doesn't have a whole lot of information. It doesn't know what that processor P is doing, but it knows at least its address. Okay. The next parameter is the time it's put, it's put into the competition, so we can keep track of time. And the third thing is the most important one of the most important parts, that's a gist. It's a very short, succinct statement in Brainish. Like, what's her name? That would be the gist that would be put into the chunk in Brainish of that, that processor's query. And then the fourth uh, parameter here is the weight, and that's a valence number, and it has to do with how important the processor thinks or considers its information. So it's a, a value that the processor is putting on. It could be positive or negative. So w the embarrassed processor, maybe that what's her name had a negative weight because <laughs> it was embarrassed or it could have been positive, I don't know, but could have been negative. And then the last two parameters uh, look like they're similar to the first, but they're not. They start off as the intensity is the absolute value of the weight, the magnitude of the weight, and the mood it starts off as the weight. And as the chunk will um, move up the competition, the, the first four parameters stay the same and the last two will, will change and we'll see how that work, works. Okay, so these chunks are gonna compete locally as they go up the competition and the local winner will move up one, one level. So let me show you how that works. So we already have two chunks, C1 and C2 there. They've already been up to those levels and I wanna tell you how the winner is chosen here. Now, at this point, um, up till now, everything I've talked about is a deterministic conscious Turing machine. But what happened is, when we were trying to do a lot of things, it turned out to be very, the computer science term is kludgy. We had to do a lot of special cases with the deterministic uh, conscious Turing machine. So we realized we had to put in some probability, a little bit of randomness. So what happens here is in the uptree competition at every node, we have something that we call the coin flip neuron. And what the coin flip neuron does is it takes two non-negative numbers, A and B, and it will output A with a probability A over A plus B, and it will output B um, one minus the probability of A. So that was what we have this coin flip neuron at each, uh, works very quickly at each uptree node. Now I want to tell you what the competition could look like, and I'm going to give you a simple uh, example. So we're going to first of all have a competition function, and we're going to map the chunk into intensity. So remember, the chunk has the six tuple, and it has lots of things, and at that point it has some intensity, so that will be the value of our competition function. And so the, uh, the algorithm is the following. So you're given two chunks, C1 and C2, over there, right? And you're going to input F of C1 and F of C2. In other words, in this case, you're going to input the intensity of C1 at that stage and the intensity of C2 at that stage into the coin flip neuron. And out will come, let's say, C1 could be the local winner with some probability, the intensity of C1 over the sum of the intensities. 
okay? And then the winning chunk will be if P1 will have the first four things of P1, the time for, T, for, for P, P1, the gist that P1 put in there, and the weight. And then the last two parameters will be the sum of the current weights, the current intensities of, of C1 and C2, and the sum of the current moods. So what's happening as the winning chunk is going up there, it's preserving uh, with a high probability, the high probability winner at the first four uh, components, but it's amalgamating information from the prior two. So as it's going up, it's actually gathering locally, it's gathering global and global, more global information. So that's what's happening with the last two parameters there. And that'll imply with a very simple induction that the probability that a chunk wins the competition will be its intensity over the sum of all the intensities. And that has a really nice property that the probability that a chunk is gonna win is independent of the location of the processor, which is really what we want. We don't wanna be able to move processors around. So for example, if you have a tennis uh, match, or tennis tournament, or a chess tournament, what they do is they seed players and they move them around so things are a little bit more balanced. We don't have to do that. And in fact, one might think of using this method uh, for tennis tournaments or whatever because it has this very beautiful property independent of location. And there's a more general, I gave you a very simple competition function. The more general one is the linear combination of the intensities and the mood at that level. And that has the nice property that in fact it's if and only if the probability of a chunk wins. If it's independent of location, it has to have that form which means that it ha that's very natural. And it, Manuel will talk more about this because it has a very nice interpretation as well. So um, that's a very natural competition function, this linear combination. Okay, so um, we now, so we get up to short-term memory by a, this competition, we're broadcast down, and now I wanna talk a little bit what's going on in the long-term memory processors. Now, each of our long-term memory processors has a learning algorithm. These are called sleeping experts algorithms. They're due to Alvin Blum. And what these sleeping experts algorithms do is they balance things. So remember when we had what's her name and some processor said her name started with T? That was wrong, right? But that processor found out later on that it was wrong and its sleeping expert algorithm will say, hey, don't be so bold. Maybe you should sort of cool it for a bit. Don't put so much weight into your chunk. You made a mistake there, cool it. Whereas another processor said her name started with S, but that processor was kind of timid and didn't put enough weight to S, so it didn't get into short-term memory, and that later on it found out, a sleeping expert algorithm found out it, it was right, so it'll tell that processor, hey, you should boost yourself, give a little bit more weight to, to, your, um, to your chunks. So in other words, the sleeping expert algorithm will embolden its processor if its chunk did not get into STM, and its, its information is more valuable than what got into STM, short-term memory, and it will hush the processor if its chunk got into short-term memory and the information in, is found at some later time to be less valuable than another chunk that failed to get in. And so this is a very mathematical, the details are mathematical, but this is the basic idea here. Okay, so already we can see some predictive dynamics. We have cycles of prediction, feedback, and learning. So when Processes put chunks into the uptree competition, that could be a prediction. Or when, it, uh, when a processor sends information to one of the actuators and affects the world, that could be some uh, prediction. Or when it sends messages back and forth to other processors, that could be a prediction. And then it's getting feedback from the broadcast, or it's getting feedback from the input from the outside world, or it's getting feedback from other processors via links. And then there's a learning coming in that's telling it, you know, helping, helping balance what's going on here. So we have these definitions again, the conscious content we say in the, in the CTM is the chunk that's in short-term memory. It, uh, the CTM's consciously aware at the time of the reception of the broadcast of the conscious content by all long-term memory processors. And we can even make a definition like the stream of consciousness is the time-ordered chunks that are broadcast from short-term memory to long-term memory. We keep on getting more and more chunks and we call that the stream of consciousness. 
but these are just definitions, and I can define anything, so what we have to do is see the reasonableness of our definitions. And this will lie in the number of concepts that the model exhibits or explains easily and naturally. And uh, so we cons we've considered a whole lot of concepts. Um, we've considered uh, phenomena that's generally associated with consciousness, like blind sight and intentional blindness, change blindness, dreams, free will, pain, pleasure. We've a, a lot of delusions. Uh, we're looking at meditation. So we're looking at a lot of phenomena and see how it might be explained, at least at a very high level in the CTM. Okay, and the, so the explanations that we give, one of our criteria is that at least at some high level, they agree with uh, cognitive neuroscience literature. So what I'm gonna do is give you three examples. These are the typical examples that you always see in any of the books on consciousness. For example, I think those three are used in Dehane's book. And the first one is the blind sight. So let's uh, see what it happens if our CTM can experience something like blind sight. Let's see if that can happen. So here we have this gentleman, actually it's a CTM, sitting on this couch on those, in a very cluttered room here, right? And the CTM is asked to go to the other room, and the CTM says, but I can't see. Nevertheless, uh, the CTM person gets up, walks to the door, avoiding obstacles, what's going on? Okay. Now, I'm gonna make the assumption that our CTM at one time was sighted, or, or viewed itself as sighted, and so because of that, at some point in time, its vision processor got linked to its motor processor. So those links had formed already. So that's my initial assumption in this particular example. Okay, so what's happening, input's coming from the outside world, uh, let's say through its eyes to the vision processor. And the vision processor has a link to the motor processor and it sends a message via the link to the motor processor, which sends a message to the walk actuator, and the guy walks across the room. But the connection from the vision processor to short-term memory either doesn't exist or had been broken along the way. And so this um, character, uh, without the vision processor having access to short-term memory, has no conscious sense that he can see because nothing's coming from vision up to short-term memory and then broadcast to get conscious awareness. So the, the information is going through the link, but it's not going through conscious, the conscious awareness process. And in fact, uh, at a very high level, um, this sort of agrees with um, some of the literature that we've seen. So the branches to short term memory are damaged, but the processor's links are functioning. Okay, the next example, of course, everybody's seen this. Uh, these are players passing a volleyball, and the, it's a movie, and the people in the audience are asked how many times do the white players pass uh, the ball, and most often everybody gets it right. There are f 15 passes, okay? But why didn't the CTM, why didn't we see the gorilla, which is in plain sight, and there's the gorilla, and you know, if you haven't seen this before, there's the gorilla, but if you've seen it before, it pops up. Um, so in our explanation in the CTM, why the CTM it didn't see the gorilla, when the CTM is given a task, its processor gives higher weight to the task, in this case white, and it probably won't see or won't be conscious of the other things that are given lower weight because then they won't, the, probab the probability of their getting into short-term memory be will be very, very small. Okay, so in other words, in this case, the explanation is the power and the effect of the weights that the processors give their chunks. Okay, and this helps explain this experience and it's consistent with explanations in humans that intentional blindness can serve as a filter for irrelevant information. And the final example is the change blindness example, the whodunit one. You may have seen this, it's a great example. Uh, here a detective comes into a room in the mansion and it says immediately, clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe. Each of you tell me your whereabouts. And the maid says, I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. And the butler says, I was brothering his lordship's thrones. And Lady Smiley says, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. And immediately the clever detective says, Constable arrest Lady Smiley. And she says, but how did you know? And he says, of course, Madam, any horticultural will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May. Okay. 
But the big mystery is what's going on. Why didn't the CTM see the many changes? Why didn't we? So you can see the detective's coat went from dark to light, and the dead guy has changed his clothes, and his knee is up and off the floor, and all the flowers have changed. And there, there is just a zillion changes in this room. And so why didn't the CTM see it? So detecting change in the whodunit video would have required significant changes in the gist. Those are the succinct, succinct things describing the beginning and the ending scenes. But the size limitations on the gist, so we're saying the, si the gist has to be sort of small, on the and size limitations on the conscious content and the clever scene transitions uh, cause the high level description to be essentially the same. So this, the same description, the gist in both cases at the beginning and the end is the scene is a living room of a mansion with a butler, maid, and detective, and a man laid out on the floor. Okay? Same gist describing those things. Okay, so the same succinct gist describes both scenes. That's all the information that we can keep in our short term memory at any particular time. Um, and of course, uh, I see uh, Reagan there, and some of this corresponds to his stuff, to see or not to see, the need for attention uh, to perceive changes in scenes, and also other um, high, so like, this is a very high level, we're not saying where or how this is happening, just here. Okay, I want to finally just go into a little bit, why would a robot with a CTM brain feel conscious, or feel it as conscious? And I'm going to give you our experience my explanation, um, I'm not totally sure this is uh, Manuel's, but, and, okay. So the, this has to do with some special processors. One of the processors are the inner speech processor. And the one that's really important here is the model of the world processor. So we're gonna look at the, how the, the CTM from the point of view of the model of the world processor. And the model of the world processor is really a collection of processors. And it, what it does is it makes models of the world. So we have the environment here on the right-hand side, and the CTM is, in its, is part of its environment. And on the left-hand side, we have the model of the world that it's making, and it makes a model of its inner world and its outer world. And the model of world processors maintains models of the world and, this, and of the CTM in these worlds, and this processor serves many purposes. It figures in explorations and exploitations in the world and in planning in general. It's how the CTM understands itself and its place in the world. It tags elements in its various models of the world in succinct brainish gist, okay, including labeling sensors, actuators as self when it consistently detects them in putting information and carrying out its own request. So here we have uh, a baby that uh, <laughs> seems to be discovering its uh, left leg. And they move. Right, so it's looking at it, seeing it can move its left <laughs> leg, and so it's starting to realize itself, that leg is part of self, and it's sort of looking over to the other side to see if it can do the same thing. Doesn't seem quite quite yet. Okay, so this is sort of how our model of the world is working. Um, and when through broadcast, the conscious Turing machine detects itself thinking about its own consciousness, the model of the world processor tags CTM and its model of its world as conscious. Okay. But now looking at the CTM from the viewpoint of the outside world, we see that something about the CTM is conscious. Specifically, the CTM considers itself conscious. But what it's conscious cannot be the model of the world processor or any processor, as processors have no feelings, they're just machines running algorithms. So we propose, I propose that the view of the CTM as a whole feels it as conscious as a consequence in part of the fact that the model of the world processor views the CTM and its models of the world as conscious, and that view is broadcast to all processors and thus to all processors associated with the feeling of consciousness. Processor may have to do with pain or whatever. So that's uh, the view, and it's kindred in spirit to Michael Graziano's attention schema theory. So uh, basically what I'm saying here is the ability to create and utilize world models is a key to the feeling of consciousness. Okay. I'd like to end with a comparison of the CTM with Bars's model. Um, 
So we both have a short-term memory, the working memory, and we both have a large audience of um, unconscious processors, powerful processors. Boris, though, has input coming from the outside world into the short-term memory and output going to the outside world uh, from short-term memory. We don't do that. We have, so our short-term memory is just a holding place for the uh, chunk that's gonna be broadcast, for the winning chunk that's gonna be broadcast. Very simple, no other function uh, at all for the short-term memory. So we have input coming from the outside world directly to uh, relevant processors, and we have outside going to the outside world directly to uh, uh, relevant actuators. The conscious event for bars is maybe between the input and uh, working memory. We're having it between the uh, short-term memory, the, the stage, and the broadcast. Um, he, uh, Boris has no specific method for long-term memory information to get into short-term memory. We have a very specific, well-defined competition, which turns out to be very natural. Uh, Boris has a central executive, as do many of these models, and we have no central executive. And this is really important that we have no central executive because this gives our machine the power to have applications to AGI. <coughs> So, so let me give you an example of how this is working. So suppose the CTM as a whole wants to solve a certain problem, like I'm a theoretical computer science, and I want to ask, does P equal NP? I would really like to solve this, as everybody else in my field would like to solve it. Okay, so my processor here will put into a competition with very high weight, does P equal NP? It'll probably win the competition and get broadcast all the way down here to all um, the long-term memory processors, and maybe some processor has the mathematics that it thinks it could use to solve my problem. There are a lot of experts down here, okay, and maybe one of them will do it, and it will put up a um, kind of a, an, an idea, maybe another processor finds that interesting, we'll start to work on it, but the CTM doesn't know which processor to work on, and in fact, if it had a central executive, that executive would have to be omnipotent to know which to ask for. So by uh, if the person just asking the query, the processor asking the query, getting it broadcast, will get other process to think about if they want to, if they have time, if they want to get involved. Okay, so, um, but maybe, this is another part, maybe ChatPT will give me an answer. I'm not gonna believe ChatPT, quite frankly, especially for a math problem, but I do have ways of checking that because I have Wolfram Alpha as one of my um, long-term memory processors, and, uh, and Wolfram Alpha will say, hey, GPT, you know, you're all full of BS, okay? It's not that you're, what you're saying sounds beautiful in English, but it's not good mathematics. I'll give you some clues. And once uh, uh, um, Wolfram gives some clues, another process says, well, that's kind of exciting. I'll get interested in that. So in other words, not having the central executive um, which in fact will be very biased and which won't actually possibly uh, direct you to the right place. I mean, you see what Elon, Elon Musk is doing with Twitter. He is directing things to all his own places. We don't want the executive director there at all. We want um, it to be broadcast and we want the processors that have the specific information to get into the game and we want other processors to be able to check that information as well. So, um, okay. So that's um, my part, thank you very much. And we have a number of papers and you can check with Manuel and me. Um, okay, and Manuel, where are you? <laughs>